My name is Laura and I hurt people for a living. Wow, if that isn't an icebreaker for the next dinner party, I don't know what is. But what sounds like a catchy phrase is actually the truth. I do work in pain research and that includes applying painful stimuli to consenting adults to find out how pain works. I've been researching pain now for over 10 years and I continue to be fascinated by it every single day. But what makes pain such an interesting and relevant topic to study? First of all, pain is something we all know. I guess it is safe to assume that each and every one of you knows how excruciating a toothache can feel or has experienced that dreadful second when you hit your little toe at the edge of the shower cabin and expect that oncoming surge of pain. Right? I know. However, pain is also something we all need. In its acute form, it notifies us about a potential threat to our body and it protects us from more serious injuries. If it weren't for pain, we would probably just leave our hand on the hot stove until it's too late and the harm is done. Do you smell that? It smells a bit burnt, does it? Not a pleasant thought. So, as this example tells you, a healthy and long life without pain is just not possible. Pain obviously works as a reliable alarm bell, which goes off whenever our pain-sensitive skin receptors get activated. You might assume now that this alarm bell rings even louder the more harmful the painful stimulus is. And in principle, that's also true. Still, the relationship between objective painful stimulus and pain experience is not an entirely linear or unchanging one. In other words, even if the painful stimulus remains exactly the same, our perception of it may vary from person to person, from day to day, or even from moment to moment. Imagine me having a toothache right now. I'm pretty sure I will still be able to give this talk. I would be focusing on something else, thanks to adrenaline. <laughs> but the same toothache might keep me awake at night when there is nothing else to distract me from it, making me regret that I didn't make this dentist appointment. What this example tells you is that pain experience is not an objective process. Instead, it is influenced by our previous experiences, by our expectations, or by our current focus of attention. Already 250 years ago, the painter Gaspare Traversi illustrated this subjective and changeable nature in two of his paintings. On the left, you see a doctor performing a surgical procedure. And this procedure is obviously very painful because the patient needs to be constrained and is opening his mouth widely in agony. On the right side, you see the same surgical procedure being performed, but the presence and the caring affection of the lady on the right is obviously a real game changer here. And suddenly the procedure doesn't appear all so painful anymore. I find this direct comparison in Traversi's pictures quite amusing, partially because I know it is true. It is indeed incredible to witness how much our pain experience, our subjective reality of pain can change from one situation to the other. However, that is not always amusing because it is not always a good thing. There are situations where the gap between objective painful stimulation and subjective reality of pain can grow so large that it poses a problem. And that is the case in chronic pain. Patients with chronic pain experience continuous pain, sometimes without any physical injury which could sufficiently explain what they feel. In their case, pain has lost its protective function and it continues to exist long after any potential threat to the body has ceased. So, Chronic pain might not be as omnipresent as acute pain, but it is still surprisingly common. 20% of the average adult population in Europe suffer from a chronic pain condition, be it fibromyalgia, arthritis, a migraine or lower back pain. If I would ask you to raise your hand if you are one of these persons, I guess a lot of hands would raise up in the air, actually including mine because I happen to suffer from a nasty migraine several times per month. Chronic pain does not only affect the person who has to live with it, but also their family, friends and social network. Chronic pain causes disability, preventing the people to work in their jobs or to do what they love. And eventually, the consequences of chronic pain also cause an economic burden to society. 
For the German healthcare system alone, they cost 38 billions of euros every year. So what these statistical facts clearly imply is that currently we are obviously not able to treat chronic pain in a satisfying manner, which would mean reducing the individual suffering to a level which does not interfere anymore with daily affairs. Now what can we do to change that? As a neuroscientist, I say, if we want to be able to treat chronic pain better, we have to understand chronic pain and acute pain better. And to do that, we have to take a closer look at the brain. Now let me start by telling you about a study which nicely demonstrates the importance of the brain in the development of chronic pain. In this study, the researchers observed 40 people with an acute back injury over the course of one year. These were generally healthy people who just have happened to hurt their backs. They suffered from something we would call a Hexenschuss in German or lumbago in English. During this one year, 50% of the participants recovered from the episode of acute pain, while for the other 50%, their pain turned into chronic pain. If you looked at the backs of these people, you would not be able to tell any difference. For all of them, the injury had healed. However, what did differ was their brain activity. On the first visit, the brains of all patients showed similar brain activity in regions which are related to acute pain processing. After one year, the brains of the patients who had recovered didn't show any pain-related brain activity anymore. However, in the brains of the patients who did develop chronic pain, the activity had gradually shifted from activity in the acute pain circuit towards regions which are more related to the processing of emotions and effect. So in a nutshell, what differentiated those patients who recovered from those who developed chronic pain was not so much determined by their affected body part, in this case the back, but by what happened in their brain. Now, how do these and other neuroimaging studies make pain-related brain activity visible and measurable? One method you can use whenever you want to know where something happens in the brain is functional magnetic resonance imaging, or in short, fMRI, which is also what the researchers did in the study which I just told you about. fMRI is a non-invasive measure of brain activity which indirectly measures neuronal activity via the increases and decreases of blood flow. And these regional changes of blood flow help us to pinpoint which brain regions are more or less active in comparison to a control group or control condition. Another method of neuroimaging which is commonly used in pain research, also in our lab, is the electroencephalography, or in short, EEG. And EEG nicely complements the method of fMRI as it measures neuronal activity directly, and it has a good temporal resolution, which means it is your method of choice whenever you want to know when something happens in the brain. These and other neuroimaging methods have already taught us some very important lessons. And one of those lessons I'm going to share with you today, and that is that there isn't such a thing as a single pain center in the brain. And that differentiates pain from our other senses, just like hearing or seeing, which do indeed rely on some very focal brain areas. Instead, in pain processing, several regions in the brain are active and they work together as a network to create and shape what we experience as pain. Some of these regions are related to bodily awareness, others to emotional processing, and even others to the preparation and execution of movement. Now let us assume for a moment that the brain is built to be efficient, not redundant. If there is so much going on during pain processing, it is reasonable to assume that the different brain activity in different regions of the brain is also related to different and complementary tasks in creating our pain experience. And indeed, brain research has begun to identify brain activity which is more closely related to the objective stimulus characteristics, like the intensity or duration of a stimulus, as opposed to brain activity which is more related to our subjective pain experience, what we actually feel. And as we already know, the painful stimulus and how we experience it can differ widely from one another. So this blooming knowledge fueled another research question, and that is, 
can we actually predict someone's momentary pain just by looking at his or her brain activity? Or in other words, can we develop an objective measure of pain, a biomarker? And equally important, why do we even want to develop such a biomarker for pain? Now, what sounds like the academic idea of a researcher is actually highly relevant from a clinical and practical point of view. Until today, if we want to quantify someone's pain, we have to rely on self-assessment. That means if we want to know whether someone is in pain, we have to ask him or her about it. Now, don't get me wrong, this is not a bad idea. As a mentor of mine always used to say half-jokingly, if everything else fails, we can always resort to talking to our patients. But that might be difficult whenever communication is impaired. Just think of patients who are suffering from dementia or who are unconscious on intensive care units or even small children. In these cases, an objective measure of pain could reasonably complement their self-assessment. And that is not all. Um, an objective measure of pain could also be beneficial in the treatment of chronic pain. Just think back to the study I mentioned earlier. Identifying those people at risk of developing chronic pain could already be helpful to start pain therapy before the pain has become chronic. But although pain research has progressed a lot in recent years, we are currently not able to reliably deduce someone's momentary pain just from looking at his or her brain activity alone. Developing a biomarker like this is currently much sought after, and it's a hot topic in the pain community and beyond. In fact, we ourselves are currently conducting a large-scale study with exactly that same goal in our lab here in Munich. So, we might not be able to read a person's pain just by looking at his or her brain activity yet. However, we have already learned something fundamentally new and important, and that is that pain originates in the brain. What we feel is only partially determined by the sensory input to our skin receptors. In large parts, it is created and shaped by processes in our brain, which take into account our previous experience, our current mood, and so much more. In the case of chronic pain, pain may even persist without any sensory input. Back pain does not originate in the back, and leg pain does not necessarily manifest in the leg. It is widely acknowledged now by experts in the field that chronic pain is not only a symptom, but it is a disease in its own right. For many years, doctors and patients alike assumed chronic pain to be something invisible. And brain imaging has changed that. Chronic pain is now not anymore considered something esoteric, potentially imagined anymore but as a physical condition with a physiological basis. I hope to spread this message from the labs of pain research to as many people as possible. You might not be able to see a person's migraine the same way you see a broken leg, at least not if you don't happen to have an MRI scanner standing in the living room, but it is there and it can be just as debilitating. Moreover, I believe that understanding the brain mechanisms underlying pain is the key for an optimized treatment of chronic pain, which could alleviate the suffering of so many people. And we are just beginning to learn where to look. Thank you.